Hello, this is Don Whitaker from BrainBlinks.com and I've got another Mandelbulb 3D tutorial for you today. I've had some people asking me about how I clean up and paint my objects and get them ready for 3D printing. So I thought I'd just kind of go over my workflow and uh, give you some tips. I've done dozens of these shapes now and I kind of have a general set of steps that I use when I first bring them into ZBrush. Uh, to get them ready for painting and uh, either using them in my game projects or for 3D printing. So I thought I'd share that workflow with you and maybe give you a head start on your own attempts at grabbing stuff from the Mandelverse. Um, I'd also kind of like to back up and show a few changes I've made to my process for actually grabbing the 3D voxel stack. So you might want to watch this Mandelbulb 3D voxel stack tutorial first if you haven't already. All right, so uh, most of the process that I'm using is the same as that original tutorial, but I just wanted to kind of mention that I've I've kind of settled on an image size for the slices of 900 by 900. Sometimes I'll go a little higher, like 1100 by 1100, if the actual 3D object I'm trying to capture is very thin. Uh, with a thinner object, you can you don't need to use a whole 900 slices to represent the object, so I can use a little higher resolution on the slices I do need and use roughly the same amount of memory when I get into Fiji to output the uh, .obj file. And in Fiji, it's kind of the biggest change I've made. I still use... Uh, the virtual stack I still do this save PGM magic and then when I'm saving for the wavefront object I've taken to using a resampling factor of one um, this uses more memory so it might not work on your machine if you don't have a 64-bit version of Windows and plenty of RAM um, but I think in my original tutorial I recommended using a resampling factor of two and after much experimentation I get a lot cleaner results now with a 900 by 900 image slice and a resampling factor of one. So play around with that uh, depending on how much memory you have in your machine. You might even, if you have uh, uh, only two or three gigabytes available of RAM, you might try uh, image slice in Mandelbulb 3D of 600 by 600 and resampling factor of one. But I just wanted to mention that because I uh, I have found I'm getting much cleaner results with that resampling factor one. So let me head on over to ZBrush and I'll show you how I clean these things up. Okay, so let's import that object that we got from Fiji. And I'll drag it out hit T to enter edit mode and as usually it's inside out so I'll go over here to display properties and hit flip I'm trying to remember not to use my custom UI for anybody out there who is trying to learn ZBrush as well so right now we've got about 1.7 million active points uh, it's not easy to get a count of faces in ZBrush I wish it was but that's probably about 3.4 million faces but anyway um, the first thing I like to do is go over here to deformation and hit unify and set pivot and what that does is kind of normalize this object within uh, a normal space in ZBrush uh, the scale of the object and set the pivot in the middle of the object. Uh, scale is kind of ephemeral in ZBrush, at least while you're working on the object, but I like to do it right away because if you do it later, then your the object you're working on can get moved from or offset from the original object, and if later we want to transfer details from this object, that can cause problems. So I just kind of like to do that right away to get it set up within ZBrush's world space. And then I usually duplicate it so I have the original. And then the two most important tools for cleaning up these objects are the Dynamesh and the Decimation Master. Excuse me. Uh, Dynamesh 
is over here under the geometry sub palette and what I like to do is set that at set the blur at about two make sure projected is on which will reproject the dynameshed object onto this object to capture more details and then I usually go for about oh, 512 on the resolution for the first try and then I hit dynamesh and it'll go through and do its magic now what I try to do is get a dynamesh object that has roughly the same amount of active points as the original doesn't have to be because as you'll notice you probably won't notice very much change at all like here's the dynamesh version here's the original version So that wasn't quite a high enough resolution. So let's, I'm gonna undo and we'll bump this up to about, I don't know, 650. You'll notice the stair stepping you get from um, the voxel slicing process. This Dynamesh actually helps get rid of some of those stair steps. And I purposely chosen a pretty simple object for this demonstration. Uh, the more complex topology you get, the uh, more problems you're going to get. So it's nice to start off with something easy. I want to try one more time with a little higher. Let's just go 700. We're going to use Decimation Master here on the next step to lower down the poly count. But I want to start with a nice, uh, as much detail as I can get. Um, without going crazy and what Dynamesh does is it makes a nice coherent clean mesh uh, using the details on this object nice orderly clean watertight mesh with no holes okay that looks good so now we're at 1.239 million active points all right now I'm going to duplicate that again. Then I usually rename this one work because this is the one I'm working on. It's easy to get them confused on this list over here. And now I'm going to go up and use the decimation master. And this is a tool that analyzes your objects and reduces the number of polygons without losing detail or with losing as little detail as possible. So first we have to pre-process -pro pre the current which will tell ZBrush to go in and check out the mesh and get ready to do its decimation magic all right it's almost done writing file to disk so now I want to go I usually shoot for about 1 million active points on the first decimation so you type in 1000 K there and hit decimate current this decimation master is an amazing tool so okay here we go active points 1 million and you can see it barely here's the undo redo you can barely see the difference even though it cut down on the number of active points and polygons so I generally kinda of think of this in my head as the original I've got a nice clean mesh with a nice even topology from Dynamesh and I've reduced it down to about a million active points which is something that fits well in my machine's RAM and uh, speed and all that and it's easy to work with and I've got almost all the detail from the original sometimes it even looks better than the original here's the original it's got the stair steps from the voxel stack process and here's the cleaned up version you can see there's very little difference and this mesh is much nicer so uh, at this point I usually save it because ZBrush likes to crash oops not that one I usually save the project file and then I usually rename this as original so I know that that's my original that I'm working with I'm gonna call it the original okay so now we have our original file and it's it's got a million active points, probably two million polys, and that's too big to 3D print. Um, I usually use Shapeways to do my 3D printing, and they have relaxed their restrictions. Um, the, now they accept up to one million polygons or 64 megabyte file in a bunch of different formats. 
um, which is much better than it used to be, which is nice. But this still is kind of overkill right here. So I think what we'll shoot for, if we're going to print this in a single color, let's try for, I don't know, 500,000 polygons or about 250,000 active points. So let's duplicate this again. Brick object. All right. So we're going to go back to Decimation Master. Pre-process pre -process current. It's hard to say. All right, we pre-process that. We want to go... Let's go for 250,000 points. Uh, let's go 200,000 points. And decimate current. All right, bingo, it's done real quick. So here's our low resolution file. I'm gonna undo and you can see there's our original. There's barely any visible difference. Okay, now if you're going to, oh, one thing we wanna do is just kind of double check that this is a watertight and valid mesh for 3D printing. And the way I found to do that is under geometry, modify topology, and then close holes. And then go down to mesh integrity and say, hey, check mesh integrity. Mesh integrity test completed successfully. When it says that, I found that it's all, it's a perfect watertight mesh and should print just fine using one of these services. It doesn't always because there's a bunch of stuff that has to happen for an object to be okay um, for 3D printing and you can look that up on the Shapeway site or wherever. If it doesn't say that, if it says there's problems or overlapping uh, reused vertices and whatnot, you can hit this fixed mesh and then hit check mesh again. and that, but if I found that if you hit check mesh and it says mesh integrity test completed successfully, then you're good to go. I'd like to do more research on that point, but uh, it's always worked for me, so I haven't worried about it too much. <laughs> and you'll notice when I did hit close holes that it did slightly change this active point count. So it did do something to our mesh. So before it wasn't quite right. Okay, now, um, if we want to print this in a single color, go to 3D Print Exporter, we're pretty much done. And then you go Update Size Ratios. And then it adjusts these. And let's say we wanted to print this object out at 3 inches high. Select inch, slide it to 3 inches, and then there you're good to go now one thing that I want to point out since I'm just doing this as a demo this object right here is solid as far as the 3d printer file is concerned so it would be much more expensive and use much more material than we need to be uh, what we'd want to do if we're going to print this out is hollow it out uh, which I'll say for another uh, another tutorial or something I just want to show the basic steps right now but um, it would be kind of wasteful to print this object as it is because it's so it's thick and it, you don't need all that material on the inside. Uh, one thing you do want to keep in mind is that you can either do it in millimeters or inches and you want to remember which one you used when you upload it. So let's just save this object. as an OBJ. I like to use the OBJ files. That's just a file format that I'm used to and use a lot. All three of these are accepted by Shapeways. I use the VRML format, which kind of cracks me up. <laughs> the flashback to the 90s uh, when I'm using the color prints. And I'll get to that in a second. So let's just try to upload this and see what happens. Remember to check inches here. Okay, so that model uploaded just fine to Shapeways. Um, 
But uh, remember, this is a super inefficient because it's a solid object. So even on the cheapest um, white plastic printer, it costs a hundred dollars, three hundred sixty bucks for the white detail. If we hollow this out and are more careful about uh, what we're doing, it would be much cheaper than that. But um, I'll save that for a future episode or tutorial or what have you. Oops. Okay, so that's the single color object. Now we want to prep one for color printing, which involves an extra step of adding a UV map, which can get pretty crazy if your object is complicated. This one is going to be pretty easy because it's basically a sphere, but more complicated objects can drive you crazy trying to get a UV map on them. Um, something like this jewel basket took me a couple of days of wrangling with uh, geometries and different um, versions of the object to get a UV map that I could use in uh, I, I set this up for unity 3d but just keep in mind the more complicated your topology the harder it is to gonna get a workable UV map on this sucker it's actually easier to get one for 3d printing than for video games but anyway so We've got, I duplicated the single color object for the color print. And now we need to reduce the poly count very low. Uh, UV, ma UV master, you don't want to run it on this uh, 200,000 active point object because it just won't work as well or work at all and it'll take forever. Um, so what we need to do is reduce the number of polygons and don't worry about losing detail because since we're going to paint this we can get a lot of those detail back from the painting and we are, and we still have our original full quality object over here that we can restore our detail from after we get the UV map so we'll go back to decimate oh, I do that every day <laughs> I wish I could get rid of that little button um, go back to decimation master Hit pre-process pre current again. And we're going to go down to, let's say, 10,000 active points. Let me do some quick math in my head here. Yeah, whatever. 10,000 active points. Decimate current. And you can see we lost some detail, but don't worry about that. It's not a big deal. Now we want to double check our geometry. Check mesh integrity. It's all good still. Now we can go to UV master. Uh, the polygroups are a way you can keep track of different sections of your object in ZBrush. And since this is a super simple object, I want to make sure we only have one polygroup going on to help UV Master figure out what's going on. Yeah, polygroups are also a way to control how the UV map is built in ZBrush. And a UV map is basically uh, a roadmap of how you can apply a 2D texture to this 3D object. And if you need more information about it, look it up on the internet. Um, but we want to hit group visible. Now, now we only have one poly group on this object. And we don't need it to be symmetrical today. Don't have to worry about that. Just hit unwrap. Okay, so now we have a UV on this, a UV map on this. Let's see what it looks like. Go down to texture map and create a new from UV check. Uh, this isn't the best texture map. Um, because it's not filling up the whole space. It's a good map. There's no overlaps. If there was overlaps or mistakes in this UV map, there would be red parts on this texture. But it's not the greatest of maps because it's not using as all the data that it could use. All right, so let's try this. Let's try 
enable control painting and let's hit attract from ambient inclusion and that's going to tell ZBrush to try to put the seams of the UV map in the crevices of this object so we'll unwrap it Now it's a little different. Let's try something else. Okay, so um, this is a decent texture map and it'll probably work all right for a 3D print, but I'm gonna try to get something a little nicer that uses all the available data on our UV map. So let's, um, let's go down to the poly groups And uh, the newest version of ZBrush actually has some nice new um, options for getting polygroups automatically. So let's go ahead and just hit this group by normals. And what that's going to do is create polygroups based on the direction that uh, the faces of the object are facing. Group visible, slide that up a little bit. So that's too many. <laughs> Group visible, slide this up 24. Now we're getting closer. What I kind of wanted was these faces as their own polygroups. So this is a good starting point. Let's, uh, I'm gonna, right now I'm gonna hold down control and shift and click on this object. And that'll, that hides everything except for the polygroup that you clicked on. If you do it again, it hides that polygroup. Control shift click. That's a decent, that's, that one's decent. I like that one. So what I want to do, I'm going to hold control shift again and click on the brush and select lasso. And I'm going to select just this half. And maybe get rid of this chunk here. And then I'm going to hit group visible from the poly groups. So now we have this group, this group, which is nice, and this group. Oops, I've seen this. Got a little extra bit over here. Group visible. Okay, now I'm gonna hide all these sections, and maybe this one. And then I'm just gonna group these all together too. This is kind of sloppy, but it doesn't it doesn't matter. You don't have to be exact at this point. Let's just see what happens when we try to UV master this. Now we want to collect. We want to select poly groups to tell ZBrush that we want it to look at the poly groups and use those as a guideline when making the uh, UV map and hit unwrap again. All right, this is a pretty good, this is a pretty good map. You see how it's using more of the space in the object. And also when you get a nice one-to-one -one relationship between the polygon and the texture, it shows up on this UV check as a white and black line. So this is a nice map. And we'll get a much cleaner transfer of the texture that we have onto this object because uh, the map is laid out according to the geometry of the object. You can see here that uh, it's got little sections for each sections of this object and that it's mapped up real nice because of the 
black and white lines on the texture on the UV check. So this is a good UV map. And I know that there's probably some people out there who are good at making UV maps by hand or more experienced at this and are kind of groaning at my UV map. But honestly, I use UV Master. I've never made a UV map by hand. I use UV Master in all my game projects on Unity and uh, it works great for my purposes. I'm not a super stickler for exact geometric maps and all this. So you'll have to play around with it until you get something you like. But I think this is a good map. And it's going to work fine for our purposes. Okay, so now we have a UV map on this low res object. And what we want to do is transfer the details from our original back onto this object with the UV map. And that's kind of a standard operating procedure in ZBrush. You do this a lot when you're working in ZBrush. And it's actually one of the reasons it's so useful for making stuff for games because I could take this object with only 20,000 faces and make it look almost as good as the one with 2 million faces in ZBrush by using normal maps and a custom texture map. So what we want to do is turn on, activate this original object and the one our oops just want to turn on this original object we still have the color print object active then we're going to go down here to project and this is um, a tool that lets you project details from one mesh onto another and it's super useful for doing this kind of stuff and what I'd like to do, first of all, is kind of up this distance to about 0 0.05. And this has to do with how far ZBrush is going to look from the original object onto, onto the other object for transferring details. I just find that it's nice to pump it up a little bit on the first couple of projections. So we'll hit project all. And that has changed our object's geometry to be closer to the original geometry. Now I'm going to subdivide our original object by hitting Control D, or I guess it's in the geometry menu somewhere, divide right here. It's OK to leave smooth on. So now we've got 60,000 active points. I'll go back down to project all. I'm going to pop this down to 0 0.04. Hit project all. Make sure you still got the one you the color print one active and the original one still turned on. Project all. And it takes longer and longer the higher resolution you go. So now we're at 60,000 active points. I'm going to subdivide again. Control D. I'm going to project all again. And we're going to do this until we get at least 2 million active points. We want more active points than there are going to be pixels in our texture map, or approximately the same number. So now I'm subdividing again. We're up to a million active points. I'm going to do project all. I might go down to 0 0.03. This object, it doesn't matter that much because our low res one was very close to our original anyway. And you can see every time we do this, the original shape or the, our color print shape with the UV is matching the original closer and closer and closer. After this one, there will be no visible difference between the two, but it might take a few minutes. Okay. So here is the color print version with the UV. And here is the original. There's virtually no difference, no visible difference between the two. So we've got all our original detail back, but we also have a UV map on this thing. And what that means is that we can now paint this object 
grab the colors that we painted as a texture map and include those with our model when we upload it. So let's just go ahead and put a quick paint job on this thing. Um, what I really have to do is masking on these objects, bring out the details, and also uh, save a lot of time. So this is going to have to be blurred up to like 40, and then I'll have to do it. This works well, I'll have to switch objects. Some of these I can mask by me, and switch them to take care of them, so I'm going to fix a lot of it. And then let's just start to mask. Shrink mask, not so much. I'm going to click on the control, click outside of it, invert the mask. I'm going to control H to hide, go to RGB, put the intensity to 5, put the color on black, go to color spray, and choose an alpha. And I'm just going to, so I'm bring out, this is just a quick and dirty texture, but here's an idea of how this CD map works. Okay, now I want to try and mask by me, but I don't want to do, I don't want to wait a long time. <laughs> so we're going to go shift D, to step down in our subdivision levels. So now I've got about 239,000 points. And we are going to go put the intensity out of the scan just a little bit and mask by me, but And that will mask off all the little workout areas, of course, that are tucked into the object. Take the while you make the lower resolutions. Control, click off object, invert the map. All right, so we've got our nice UV map. We've got a quick paint job on here, and we're ready to output this file and get it 3D printed. Let's update our size ratios just to make sure we're on the right object here. And again, this is an inefficient object. It's too solid to really print. I mean, you could print it. It would just be more expensive than it needs to be, but I'll go into that later after I get a better workflow down for that. Um, up till now, I pretty much printed objects that didn't need to be hollowed out, so I don't have a lot of experience doing that yet. Let's set that for three and a half inches. And I've had the most luck with Shapeways and ZBrush with this VRML format. So let's go ahead and, oh, one thing we gotta remember to do, we need to go down to the subdivision level with the proper number of active points. So let's see. Well, let's see what this one does. That's going to be about 500,000 active points. We need to keep the uploaded file under 64 megabytes. So let's try this subdivision level with 239,000 active points. Hit VRML. And I, wanna, I like to put it in a folder by itself because there's more than one file. And then it's going to output the mesh, and then it's going to output the texture in the WRL. So then what we need to do is just zip it up, make a zip file containing those two files so we can upload them together. And then we'll go back to uh, Shapeways and upload it. Remember to choose inches because that's what we chose before. Okay, so here we are on the Shapeways. The, the file uploaded good. We got our colors on there correctly and uh, it all looks good. We're kind of bumping up against the poly count limit and file size limit, but it worked fine. And this one, even, even with the inefficient objects, it's only be 160 bucks to print full color sandstone. So there is an overview on how to prep stuff for 3D printing from Mandelbulb 3D. Um, I hope that gives you a good idea of where to start and the, the general process. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention, um, there are some automated UV map that will work on any object here. You can use under the UV map option in the tool menu. There's several options for automatically adding a UV map to your object. I've had much better success making my own custom UV map, but if you do want to try this, try this adaptive UV tiles and see how that works for you. That makes a UV map that's not very efficient, but it works with just about any mesh you put it on. So if you're having trouble getting a custom UV map, go ahead and try that and see how it works for you. And I will make another tutorial in the future that shows more details, maybe how to hollow out a shape, uh, maybe go into detail about how to use masking to get some free details while you're painting and stuff like that. But I think that'll 
uh, be enough to get you headed in the right direction if you're trying to get your first 3D print going. So um, thanks for watching. Let me know if you have any questions or comments. Uh, hit the like and subscribe button on YouTube and uh, check out my new website too. I recently redid brainblinks.com and uh, I'm pretty happy with the way it looks. Uh, nice consistent layout and uh, much simpler and to the point than my last website. So thanks a lot and I uh, will see you next time. Bye.